Good afternoon, everybody. Mary Hunt here at the Water Office. I'm happy to welcome you to our water talk today. I'm here with Diane New and Pamela Miller and Lisa Lautenbach, and we are ready to begin with Dr. Monique Moultrie, who is our special honored guest today. We're in the Water Office in Silver Spring, Maryland, and um, we are delighted to welcome back Monique since she has been here for earlier sessions with us. And I'm gonna start right off the top and recommend her book in a very hearty way to you. Um, it is called Hidden Histories, Faith and uh, Black Lesbian Leadership. It is published by Duke University Press and it is a very fine piece of research and I think a very necessary part of our history. So I'm delighted to have Monique with us. Let us begin as we always do at water with the land acknowledgement. And while you do that, I ask you to mute your um, Zoom, just press your own uh, mute button there so that we don't have any ambient noise during our presentation or during our discussion. And if everyone would please do that, I would appreciate it. Again, I'm going to begin with the land acknowledgement. This is something that we at water have incorporated into our programs to remind ourselves of why we do what we do and what we need to do more of, given the systemic injustice indigenous and other peoples of color face in this country. A land acknowledgement is a beginning, not an end, a time to reflect on our history and to commit to justice making. We at Water are on indigenous land in Silver Spring, Maryland. This is the traditional and contemporary land of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples. We acknowledge the trauma and injustice toward indigenous people that is deep in US culture and history we join in efforts to eradicate it and to make reparations for the genocide involved. Water's work, as many of you know, whether intellectual, spiritual, or liturgical, is aimed at bringing about social justice, so a land acknowledgement is a proper way to start. I ask you to take a quiet moment and consider the Native people on whose land you sit. You're welcome to put their names in the chat if you wish, but just to take a moment to remember them and to be grateful for the sharing of their land. Thank you very much. Welcome again, what a pleasure. Water's work brings feminist women as spiritual values and intellectual work to the service of social change. We feature and count among us many of the most insightful and effective scholar activists, including my friend and colleague, Dr. Monique Moultrie. Our hope is that by sharing their work in this setting, we're socializing the resources of feminist and womanist work in religion and thus spreading tools and energy for justice. That's really the work of water, to spread the tools and the energy for justice that emerges from feminist and womanist work in religion. Let me simply uh, inform you of today's format, and then we will proceed with Dr. Moultrie. I will introduce her. She will have 20 or 25 minutes to introduce us to her new book. And again, I'm going to repeat it for emphasis and so that you can make note of it. We'll have it in the notes that follow this, Hidden Histories. Uh, and I think it's really important to say faith and black lesbian leadership is not something that has been studied very often. And uh, if at all, Hidden Histories, Faith and Black Lesbian Leadership is a book that I think you will wanna have and a book that some people I hope will um, emulate in terms of their own writing and that we might get the histories of many other particular groups involved in our field. There'll be plenty of time for dialogue after Monique finishes, we'll have questions and discussion. I invite you to listen and to enjoy, maybe have your lunch or your dinner, depending on where you are. And we'll take notes, which will be on our website shortly, along with the video of this session. You're welcome to share this. We socialize all of these resources, whether you use it for teaching or for community work. Uh, we wanna get the word out on this book and certainly, um, Monique's presentation of it is a rare opportunity that I think many people who are not here today will want to avail themselves of. We'll end at two o'clock Eastern time to respect everyone's schedule. You can then re-listen or point other people in the direction of this teleconference by going to Water's website at www.waterwomensalliance.org. Just look under programs and teleconferences. And in a few days, we'll have both the video and the notes up for your use. 
We always finish at the top of the hour so that you can make a graceful exit if necessary. But we do keep the Zoom open after that for people who wish to converse a little bit uh, after the two o'clock time uh, frame. But the official session ends then and with our gratitude to the speaker for her valuable contribution. And I know today will be no exception to this rule. And Monique has said that she will be around for a few minutes afterwards so we can continue the conversation as needed. I'm sure there'll be many comments and questions. Let me introduce then my friend and colleague, Monique Moultrie, who is no stranger to water. She was with us in March of 2018, talking about her informative book, Passionate and Pious, Religious Media and Black Women's Sexuality. Some people will recall a conversation that she and I had in this format with our third co-editor, Keisha Ali, about a book we wrote together, A Guide for Women in Religion, Making Your Way from A to Z. It came out in, in 2014 and we had the program then. This book, um, I think, was helpful to many people at a time when academic job market, uh, the academic job market was drying up and people needed to get creative about their careers in religion. So having worked with Monique, I know the carefulness of her scholarship as well as the thoroughness of her approach. Let me quote from her official biography so as to get the salient details correct about her life. Monique is Associate Professor of Religious Studies, Africana Studies, and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Georgia State University in Atlanta. She received her PhD from Vanderbilt, her master's in theology, uh, theological studies from Harvard Divinity School, and a BA from Duke. She's been involved in a range of scholarly efforts, including recently as co-principal investigator on a Henry Luce Foundation Advancing Public Knowledge on Race, Justice, and Religion grant that funds the Garden Initiative for Black Women's Religious Activism. And I'm hoping that um, the work that we see in this book on Black lesbians will be mirrored in some of the work in the Garden Initiative. Again, from her bio, I quote, outside of the university, Dr. Moultrie serves on the board of directors of the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer Religious Archives Network. She's content development, uh, she was a content development working group member for the Columbia University Center on African-American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice. And she has been part of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choices Scholar Group, a group of religious scholars collaborating at the intersection of religion and reproductive justice. Within the larger American Academy of Religion Guild, Dr. Moultrie is the former um, co-chair of the uh, former status of women in the profession chair and former co-chair of the religion and sexuality unit. So she's a very active colleague in the field. The book we'll explore today, Hidden Histories, Faith and Black Lesbian Leadership, was published in 2023, in which Dr. Miltry reports on the lives of Black women religious leaders of various backgrounds. I'll let her tell you more, but I welcome you, Monique, for now the third time to a water talk and I thank you again for being here and being so much a part of the larger community of scholars working to bring our scholarship to the service of social justice. Welcome, Dr. Monique Moultrie. Thank you so much. I am so excited to join all of you. Good afternoon, good evening, um, depending on where you are. I also, my heart is so happy to see smiling faces, but especially to share in this space with Mary and Chrissy and Judith, who are all tangible proof to me that black feminists and white feminists can do the work and do it well, um, and who have sponsored me in my own um, path as an academic, but who've also reminded me um, of the call to do leadership well, to not just lead, but to be responsible in leadership. And so I hope some of those themes are things that I bring up. Um, I'm going to give a just a brief overview. So we're all talking, you know, apples and apples. Um, and again, I begin with a great thanks to the incomparable water founder, co-founder, Dr. Mary Hunt for this opportunity. And um, I'm going to jump in, give you a bit of backstory and share some of my hopes for the text and then conclude by just giving you a summary of what each chapter hopes to do, and then leave space for us just to, for me to hear from your questions and me to just answer what I can. So at its core, Hidden Histories elevates stories of US Black women, religious leaders who proudly claim a lesbian and religious identity. 
I wanted to understand how these leaders combated racism, sexism, and homophobia, and did so while being committed to social justice. When I first began doing these interviews, I wanted to chronicle their histories. And somewhere along the way, I wanted to chart a way forward for Black religion. As a scholar and as a Christian, I found their stories transformative, and I wondered how could I help amplify their messages in both scholarly and public spaces? I mentioned early on in the book, um, especially in the introduction, my concerns about my authority and voice in the text. No one questioned more than I whether I should be the one to bring these stories to academic visibility. As a then heterosexually partnered member of the Black church, many of my identity formations were foundational to the oppression of my research subjects. I see the book as my long apology for my own homophobia and internalized sexism. I grew up in a conservative Christian community and I spent a great deal of time as a high school student campaigning for all things conservative. Uh, so I lived about an hour and a half from Jerry Faldwell's base and um, I, I did all the things uh, that you see Jerry Falwell students doing. Uh, and I did that because my training told me that's what it meant to be a Christian. And I see this book as my tangible recompense for how publicly wrong I was. And I'm trying to show that you can learn better. You can change your mind. You can still learn through life. I start with this personal caveat because as a womanist, my scholarship centers the experiences of Black women. And so the book is also autobiographical. It acknowledges that autobiographical reflection is a useful tool in our scholarship. I had to confront my own stuff as I did the interviews. I tried to be transparent about the fact that I was a stranger to many of the people that I interviewed, but I wanted to share their life stories in the hopes that together we could inspire others. In general, my scholarship, my academic life explores how religion, race, and sexuality intersect with gender prescriptions and norms found primarily in Christian contexts. And the first book uh, that Mary mentioned, in that first book, I'm talking about how Black women asserted agency in sexual domains. So uh, particularly celibacy ministries. And in the second book, I see myself as focused on how sexual and religious actors exert agency in religious and secular spaces. While most of my work, uh, both in print and the publicly accessible work that I do is centered in sexual behavior. This book, I really want to center in love and sexual attraction rather than sex acts. I took great pains to only share in print what was relevant to their professional lives, even though I knew data that the transcripts did not provide. I've said that this book helped me realize as a researcher that people don't owe you all of themselves and that even our professional leaders get to turn off their leadership gene. They get to Netflix and chill. I knew many great activists that were also quite frankly, piss poor people. So although I wasn't trying to sanitize their lives, my judgment calls did favor discussing their nine to five selves rather than their home interior aspects. I'm also, aware now in ways that I wasn't aware when I began conducting these interviews some 10 years ago, that there's a tendency to privilege the leadership experiences of those more senior in age over younger activists and leaders. I was trained in an apprentice model of the academy where senior scholars bless your entrance into the guild or they gatekeep to keep you out. And perhaps unconsciously, I replicated this in my interviews of senior scholars over emerging leaders. Yet time and again, my interviewees showed how the apprentice model doesn't work. It isn't sustainable as a leadership skill set. The younger leaders actually started their activism at 13, at 15, at 18, with many of them being out in their sexual identities longer than their senior com companions. They were able to activate themselves in multiple spaces at much earlier ages. And I think that their collaborative leadership assumed they all came to the table equal and equipped. As I've lived a lot of life in my now short 
46 years, I recognize it isn't just age that is the teacher, but it's the experiences one has that is the ultimate teacher. And one can be young with sizable impact in ways that I think I initially undervalued. Now that I've provided some of the background with my text, let me offer an overview and explain why I situate the book as a Black feminist or a womanist endeavor. The overall book addresses the invisibility of Black lesbian religious leaders and scholarship on Black religion, leadership, and activism. By examining oral histories of 18 cisgender Black lesbian religious leaders, the project uses womanist or Black feminist history to reevaluate and revise modern understandings of how race, gender, and sexual identity interact with religious practice. How these practices and organizing in the 21st century are key components to really understanding what I explore as womanist ethical leadership. The book investigates the social justice orientation of these leaders and theorizes how their models of leadership could be instructive for future generations. As far as I know, at the time that I wrote it and when it came out last year, the book is the first collection of oral histories of US-based Black lesbian religious leaders. Most of my interviewees were Protestant Christians, uh, ranging in age from 37 to 72. Although I did diversify a bit by conducting additional interviews with two spiritualists, a Jewish rabbi, and a Buddhist lay leader. I pursued these interviews to answer three main questions. How are Black lesbian religious leaders incubators for social justice activism? How does spirituality animate their social justice activism? And how can these leaders function as models for ethical leadership for future generations? The book answers these questions while preserving their stories for posterity on the LGBTQ RAND website. As Mary mentioned, um, I'm on the board. I've worked uh, long for a long time with LGBTQ RAND. And um, when I first started doing these interviews, I did them for the website. And so as I continue to do interviews, uh, all of them, the audios, the videos, and the transcripts are housed there, which in my work way is an attempt to close gaps in scholarship on Black lesbians and faith and queer literature. I set out to speak against the erasure of Black queer history and to help my subdiscipline, the field that I work in, which is African-American religion, think more critically about how our field has been misshaped by the elision of these narratives. I use oral history with a social justice lens as my research agenda is to pursue a healing and restorative history. My concern with their social justice activism has been because I'm interested in their leadership styles because I contend that their ethical leadership requires concern for the greater good and holistic activism like working for the well being of the planet and all of its inhabitants. For my interviews, I surmised that our Black lesbian interviewees had a unique leadership style that went beyond the institutional building and narrow focus of the LGBTQ community. Women's leadership was impacted by the intersectional experiences of sexism, racism, and heterosexism, as well as their experiences of their faith and their spirituality. This impact was felt in even the ways they envisioned themselves as leaders and what types of activism they were engaged in. For example, when I examined their stories, the themes of resistance through social justice activism, through spirituality, through authenticity, and cooperative leadership came to the forefront because they utilized such intersectional frameworks to lead due to their increased awareness and empathy for others. Thus a womanist ethical leadership model patterned after these black lesbian religious leaders would emphasize leadership strategies that were uh, non-hierarchical, that worked outside of institutions and were in fact intergenerational. So now I'll turn to just some chapter summaries and open it up. So in chapter one, the text discusses the women's varied theological journeys through mainly Christian denominations and other religious traditions, placing their narratives into institutional contexts. This chapter emphasized their shared experiences overcoming racial and gender oppression in religious spaces. In chapter two, my focus is on womanist authenticity 
or existence as resistance, where I'm trying to show how authenticity amplified their calls for justice, because by standing in their truths, they were better able to advocate for others. This chapter puts Charles Taylor's notion of authenticity into conversation with Stacey Floyd Thomas's theory of radical subjectivity to highlight the significance of merging their religious, their racial, and their sexual selves. Chapter three is in fact my personal favorite chapter. It focuses on the activist orientation of these black lesbian religious leaders, illustrating a form of womanist spiritual activism. And this is a term uh, coined by womanist psychologist, Lele Maparayan. And in that she's talking about the everyday acts of rebellion and resistance and collective community building. Chapter four highlights the spiritual foci of my non-Christian interviewees by reading their experiences via the theorizing of womanists like Diana Hayes or Emily Towns or Melanie Harris, whose discussions of womanist spirituality leads to chapter five, which provides specific skill sets and behaviors that support cooperative leadership. Finally, the book concludes with a challenge to womanist theorizing to include a more pluralistic vision of Black female leadership as sustainable social change agents. If I had hopes for the text, I'd say my top three were to do justice to their stories, to amplify their leadership as our way forward. Um, I've said publicly that I think the future of the Black church itself um, and Black religion is by following our queer leaders and to educate and motivate others to create social change. I'm hopeful I delivered on being transparent in voice and authority. My intention was to be equally present with their story. So over half the book is verbatim words from their transcripts. As I tried to indicate where I made judgment calls, like calling their leadership womanist, when that was a term that they rarely used. Um, only three of my participants used that term to refer to themselves. I intended to amplify their stories with every chance that I got to point to their leadership as what true sustainable leadership looked like. I've tried to portray them as flawed leaders with their own successes and their own failures, but overall the leaders that I think the world is waiting for because of their capacity to see interlocking oppressions and fight for all. Finally, while each of these women are remarkable leaders, I did not set out to write a book for queer leaders. Instead, I wanted to write a book that says to each person who cares about others that there are examples to follow in creating sustainable social change. While these women are my models, I'm hoping that those who get a chance to read the text will add to the list others that help propel us towards creating a better world. I'll stop here with my gratitude for your attention and I'm really anxious for our conversation. Thank you so very much, Monique Moultrie. We are delighted to have this overview of your book and um, we now have the opportunity to have some conversation about it. I would like to simply um, hawk it shamelessly one more time so that you get a look at how beautiful it is as a, as a volume with the pictures of some of the interviewees on the front. And um, I, I think Hidden Histories, Faith and Black Lesbian Leadership is such a provocative title because so few people see these things as going together. Duke University Press, 2023. Uh, I highly recommend it. However, there is an error in the book, which I'd like to begin to point out as I did at the American Academy of Religion, um, where on page eight, you claim to be an ally. And um, I, I take issue with this word because I think you are in fact an advocate. I think of an ally as someone who is supportive, who joins and strengthens, and we need allies. But as an advocate, I think of someone who takes leadership, who steps out alongside colleagues, who spotlights and highlights the strength of others and amplifies their voices and images as you have just done. And that's what you do here, and that's what you do for Movements for Justice, and I really want to call this what it is. You, as an advocate, conclude your book with these words, I will continue to use my voice to point toward their leadership as our path forward and acknowledge that they are in fact the leaders we've been looking for. And you've just said that yourself, page 186. Monique is an advocate and an ally, of course, but so much more. I always joke that I'm not a biblical scholar nor even particularly Christian, 
But even I know enough to say that in John 14, 16, Jesus did not say, I give you an ally, but an advocate. I thank you uh, for this book that needs to be imitated if we're to get oral histories of many more hidden persons, not just hidden women, but hidden persons in feminist, womanist, and queer religious leadership. And I, I really mean sincerely how important I think this book is, both for its content and for what it models in terms of scholarship as lifting up the stories of people whose stories are not heard. That being the case, let's open the floor for discussion. Please use the hand, the raise hands function and tell us your name, where you're from, and then please be brief so we can hear from as many people as wish to speak. I will close us officially at two with even more gratitude to Monique and those uh, who want to stay on a little bit can talk after that as well. I'm sure our conversation will not be finished today, but that's the wonderful thing about our common work. We always have more to do. So um, as you begin to pull your questions together, Monique, what an advocate you are, and thank you for that. I've been privileged to meet a number of the, woman, the women whose lives were lifted up in this volume, uh, Darlene Garner, Candy Holmes, Emily Towns, Yvette Flinder. And in each case, I learned more about the person by reading this study. But I also felt that what you represented credibly uh, explained the person that I already knew. It's always a little hard when you read about people you know and somebody has sugarcoated them or exaggerated them or even been more critical than they ought to be of them. This, this causes a kind of cognitive and emotional dissonance and raises questions like, what did I miss? Did I really miss that person entirely? Whom, who did I think I knew there? But these women, as you told their stories and as they told their stories in their own words, were all very familiar to me. So I simply want to reinforce and vouch for the authenticity about authenticity that you talk about, which is one of the major categories of analysis. And to you, I say, well done, making you not only an advocate, but a very trusted advocate. I wondered just to start the conversation, have any of them given you their feedback on the book? And if so, what might you share with us that, that they shared? What did they find? Yeah. And then please um, line up in the queue with your using the raise hands function, or if you don't find it or you don't like it, just um, raise a hand and we'll see you waving and call on you. So please go ahead, Monique, with that. And then um, we'll be ready for the next person's question. Yeah, so Bishop hey, Flinder- have they gotten to you and what have they said? Yeah, Bishop Flinder was one of the first. Uh, so the book came out in March and then in April here in Atlanta, uh, there was a conference on seeing the future of the black church in the rainbow. And um, Ralph Watkins hosted that conference with an intent of doing sort of like continued continue Christian ed. Um, and he reached out to black churches and black seminarians. And it ended up being sort of just a love fest for people from the fellowship for um, affirming ministries. So Bishop Flunder was one of the keynotes and she brought all her people. And that's that was the audience and it was a, a great time. Uh, but while I was there, Bishop, I had already, when the book came out, I'd sent um, all of the participants a copy and, and she had glowing things to say. And um, it, it is typical what the Bishop blesses is blessed. And so um, I don't know that anyone who purchased a book agreed or disagreed, uh, but Bishop said it was good. So it became good for them. I countered to that though, I sent a copy to Sandra Larson um, who is the Jewish rabbi I mentioned in the text. And um, in the text, I'm very clear that I am quoting a source that says she's the first black lesbian ordained um, rabbi. And, and I say in like parentheses, this is doubtful because there's Georgia Kennebrae who graduated before her from the Reconstructionist um, college. Uh, but she took quite offense at that and and uh, publicly like stated on Facebook how offended she was uh, that I perpetuated this error that the original source that I had quoted was in error and that I had repeated the error and that I had done double damage by sending her a copy of the book where I had made errors. Like why would she want a flawed text? Uh, and I immediately publicly, uh, she publicly smacked me on my hand and I immediately publicly took that and said, you know, I, I hear that. And if Duke gives me an opportunity to make that change, I absolutely will. 
Um, I, I didn't clarify, like I have clarified for you all that, hey, no, I think I, I, I was integrous there. But I, I, I took her feedback. And then I said, beyond that, when you can get beyond that error, you know, I'd really like to hear more of your thoughts. Um, and we've had some pretty nice exchanges since then. So I don't know that um, I've smoothed those waves, but um, I haven't. And then I've also heard from one of the others that's on the cover. Um, she's a spiritualist whose name is now escaping me. She's um, the head in that chapter on authenticity. Uh, the title of the chapter comes from her. And she, I was clear with me that she loved the text and uh, Reverend Deborah Johnson is her name. And Deborah loved the text and was really proud um, and was really proud because the stories were being told. I don't think she cared much about me framing her as a woman as ethical leader, but she was really excited that others would know the struggle. Um, and, and for her, um, she talks about it, and I, I talk about her talking about this in the authenticity chapter, like she never imagined a world that we now can have. And so to have others understand that there once was a world where people were institutionalized, people were, you know, really persecuted in ways um, that, that are part of our historical knowledge, but like these are things she lived. And she was a part of several class action lawsuits in California to change policy in California. And so she really wanted to highlight the, the history that you now like take for granted is a part of what people have to fight for. And she wants those fights to be memorable. And so she's really appreciative. And so that, that has been sort of heartwarming. Great. Thank you. The floor is open. Um, please feel free. Use the uh, reaction down on the reaction button. Please feel free to use the raise hand function as I have just done and then lower your hand when you're done. So um, please go ahead. Stand on no ceremony. This is water. Okay, um, we have two people here who are who have questions. We'll start with Graziella. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm in Dr. Moultrie's class. I'm so excited to be here and just to listen more about this text and just like the amazing work and insight into your community as well. Um, I wanted to know if you could um, speak to, I know you were saying at the top of the hour that since the text has come out, you haven't seen any other um, moves towards folks like talking about these types of stories and these types of histories. And I was wondering since then, have you seen other scholars or other community members, you know, making any type of archive or moving towards um, talking about these histories? Thank you. Um... Yes and no. In particular for Black religious communities, I've seen a couple spurts and starts of um, organizations starting um, and getting funded and um, setting out as the agenda that they, they want to archive. Uh, and I haven't yet seen the archive produced. And I, I just led students last year. I led a team at Columbia University um, that gathered oral histories of Black queer leaders uh, and congregations. We were interested in understanding um, not just the story of the leader, but how did the followers come to be on board? Um, and over the course of that year, um, they, the students that I was working with, I was working with a team of five students uh, they gathered uh, probably 12, 12 to 15 um, oral histories. And unfortunately, I mean, fortunately and fortunately, the Arcus Foundation uh, had given Columbia a grant to gather 
those stories and do a bunch of other projects. And um, they ran out of money, the grant wasn't renewed. And so there isn't money to publicize what was done. So we have those stories, we have those oral histories, they exist, um, but they're, they don't exist in the real world anywhere. I can't point people to them, I know that they were done. I, and I've seen that happen in more cases where I know people were interviewed and it's the follow through of getting those interviews then publicized um, that I think is a challenge, um, especially because archival work is expensive and keeping work, um, professionally keeping work is expensive. Uh, and so those are, those are some challenges. Um, I know for Jewish, lesbians and queer persons at the Loose Foundation who funded my um, garden initiative project. Uh, and we're doing oral histories for my project. And again, it's the same story. We've run out of funding and we're fundraising again. Uh, so we've done them and we're making space for them on our website, so they're not up yet. But Loose also funded a story, uh, a grant for Jews of color. Um, and I know the person, Samira Mehta, who uh, is running that grant. And she's also doing oral history. So I know that there will be um, some Jewish stories. And I think she actually has a focus on trans experience as well um, that she'll be highlighting. Uh, thank you very much for your question, Graciela. I think you are probably the most envied person here because you're a student this year of Dr. Moultrie. So um, lucky you. I'm sure yeah. it's uh, I'm sure it's a great experience. Let's move on to Priscilla uh, Snyder, whose hand is up. Priscilla, you need to unmute Priscilla if you would be so kind. Thank you so much for your presentation. I I enjoyed it very much. Um, how many women are did you are included in the book? Number one and number two, are there any that you interviewed that um, that didn't make the book, shall we say? Yeah, so I interviewed 20, um, 20 women and seven men. So originally when I first started doing the interviews, I was doing LGBTQ uh, and somewhere along the way, um, I focused on black lesbians. Uh, and so of those lesbians that I interviewed, I interviewed 20 and 18 made the book um, and two did not make the book. I just told this to my class yesterday because I could not get the informed consent. I, um, as a womanist ethnographer, as a womanist qualitative researcher, my commitment is I only want to share what you want shared. And so it meant that every transcript and audio went back to the participant so they signed off and gave me informed consent when I was doing the interview. But before I would publish it, I wanted them to again, go back through um, what I was going to be publishing from. And two people because of life, I, I don't think they particularly objected. They just, I hunted them down and hunted them down and hunted them down. And finally Duke gave me a D-Day and was like, if we don't have signatures by this date, we're taking those paragraphs out. We're taking those chapters out. Uh, and that's what happened with those two. But they live. Um, one came back to the fold. One finally did pop back up. And so on my personal website, Monique Moultrie uh, dot com or dot yeah, dot com. Monique Moultrie dot Monique Moultrie dot com. Renee Hill is one of those participants that I interviewed uh, who I had chased for 20, 20 years. Renee has been my like shero. Uh, she was one of the first black lesbian Episcopal priests. And uh, now she's an EFA practitioner. She is a, her wife is a rector and is a priest, and she is an EFA practitioner and a drummer and like does all these cool things. Um, and I chased down Renee for decades, literally. Um, and so I finally got her interview done, and I finally got her to consent for the interview to be publicly accessible. But it was after the book was published, so it's it's up on my website. That leads me to ask, are all of the interviews up on your website? That is, is all the video available? So all of the audio in the book is on the LGBTQ rant website. Okay. Mandy Carter is the only holdout and Mandy, maybe fingers crossed, will go up this week. Um, Mandy wanted to go line by line through her transcript and I held her 
I held her files until she gave me the okay. Um, and, and in fact, it's not the okay for the whole thing. So there'll be a like abrupt cutoff and that's mm -hmm. the point at which she stopped editing. And she said, well, put this up, put this up is better than nothing being up. And so we're going to go live with that. Great. So You're what's going to be on my side are just the few um, that I'm got that I've gathered since then. And um, those that I had done, but didn't make it into the book. Wonderful, because you, you have a treasure here and you are it's such a model for people in other um, religious traditions and uh, racial ethnic groups and, and just so many people who uh, I think will learn from your methodology and also uh, from what you're demonstrating right now, your own, not only authenticity, but your carefulness. And um, I think this kind of respect for people is why you will continue to have people agree to be part of your work because obviously they will from experiences like this realize that their lives will be held very uh very carefully very carefully let me turn then to pamela miller who has her next comment pamela please go ahead yes um i don't have a question it's a comment and i want to say mary you jumped on it in the beginning i wrote down that this was written by someone from outside the community and it is such a um, blessing when people know that they have advocates, someone there to walk beside them and um, just to share. We're in this era when there's so much division, um, what you teach in school and um, just to be there, just appreciate that someone who is not from the community can step out to say, yes, you have allies, you have friends, you have supporters here and you're just another person like us. We might do some things different, but we are, in fact, just human beings. Thank you. Thank you. Monique, any comment or shall we? No, thank you. I, I received that and I agree. Yeah. yeah, Pamela hits the nail on the head with that one. Absolutely. Okay, let's, um, let's see. I don't have a name here other than, yes, your name is? Uh, you need to unmute, please. Yep, uh, Diana Rawlings. Um, oh, okay, Diana Rawlings, great to have you, yeah. Yes, I'm a, <clears throat> a Catholic sister, uh, and anyway, so we called our little gathering space here the Wichita Back Porch, so. Oh, okay. Uh, I really appreciate all this information. I guess I'm in curious if um, you had any contact, I haven't read your book, uh, it, with Black Catholic sisters, Um I don't even know other than there's a national organization of black Catholic sisters uh, that might have some information, but I'm not aware of any that would fit into your category of research. Uh, so I'm just curious uh, and what your thoughts might be, how to, how to get their voice out. Uh, I, in addition to that, I don't know if you're familiar with new ways ministries, but a couple of years ago, <clears throat> Uh, there was a book published, it's called Love Tenderly, Sacred Stories of Lesbian and Queer Religious. And that was the very first time uh, there were like, I think, 18 or 20 authors, uh, Catholic sisters, some. Uh, the Mercy Sisters were really phenomenal in their support. And every author of that Sister of Mercy used her real name and uh, community initials. Otherwise, a lot of us that wrote didn't, uh, weren't quite ready yet. So anyway, that's another thing that's happening. But any comments on Black Catholic sisters and their leadership? Yeah, so none made it into the book. And after I kept doing interviews. So at a certain point, I had to call the book done and move on. But I kept doing interviews thinking, maybe I'll do a companion. This will be part two. Um, and so I reached out specifically, um, I wrote a grant to actually diversify my um, pool. And I reached out to four Black sisters and um, all four said, well, no, three of the four said no. One said, curiously, I don't know how you would have gotten my name for such a study. And I said, I got it from your girlfriend. Like, 
I wasn't being flippant. I literally got her name from her girlfriend who is not a sister. She is in another denomination. And <laughs> at what it reminded me, and I'm laughing about it, but it's actually quite tragic, is the, the cost of the closet. And I worried after the fact, after I, I responded truthfully, that is how I got her name. What I heard in that request or that question was really who else knows mm -hmm. and what will happen if others know. The three that told me no said no, but when they retire, come back to them. So it was a, a respectful no. Like I understood why that no and it wasn't really a no, it was a, I, I will, but not now. Uh, and so absolutely, I think these are stories that need to be amplified. Um, and, and I worry uh, truthfully about those stories being lost mm -hmm. before people can get to the point where they're able to share. Thank you. On a personal note, that's why I think the book of Lesbian uh, Love Tenderly is, it was so profound. Um, because it is a cost and there is a, a lot of fear. And so with the Mercy Sisters were so public, that was such a great witness. So thank you for all your work that you do for us. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, really delighted to have you with us, uh, Diane Rawlings, and so so uh, important to your comments. I had also uh, thought about that book and had brought it, I think, Monique, it's in the notes mm -hmm. that I sent to you. Um, we'll put it in the notes. It's edited by um, Grace Sertival, who's a uh, part of the American Heart Heart um, IHM community in Scranton. And um, the, the great thing about that book is that uh, since its publication, I'm uh, under the impression that four of the anonymous authors have now attached their names to their stories, maybe more even by this time. And um, I think it's really exciting. Also, the Sisters of Mercy, I want to give them a shout out because, and not in a disinterested way, I was actually on the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Committee that they set up uh, six years ago because of some problems within their own community in this regard. And they were so gracious as to um, develop something called Every Life Cherished, which is a way of lifting up the lives of those women and apologizing for how lesbian, queer, um, bi, and perhaps even trans women have been traded um, within religious communities and particularly in their own. So um, that's a wonderful, wonderful example of how this work can be spread. And that's why um, very much, Diane, what I had in mind with Monique's book is what needs to be done, um, say, for Catholic lesbians, even uh, white cisgender Catholic lesbians. But I want to push this, too, in terms of um, connecting it with um, Shanine D. Williams' book, Subversive Habits, Black Catholic Nuns in the <laughs> long African-American freedom struggle, which is, a, I think, another important book. And I think even though Monique's book is um, um, mainly to do with Black lesbians, there's so much more to that experience of other um, of other Black Catholics that, that we in that tradition have a lot of work to do. Uh, so this is a, a good way to, to get at it. Um, it also is a good way to say, Monique, that your research methodology followed by, say, Presbyterian queer people or Episcopalian queer people or Catholic queer people would be really just stunning as a way of moving forward. And that is work we need to do. And we have already lost some of those people that you've mentioned. So um, push on, my dear, push on. Uh, Jessica has a question. Go ahead, Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I live in the Chicago land, South Suburbs. And thank you um, for putting on this um, talk today. I had not heard of this organization, but I'm very interested to read the book. Um, my question has to do with um, some of the everyday practices. You you mentioned that um, the women you interviewed were able to find capacity as leaders because of their ability to see oppression. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it's probably because they endured a lot of contempt based on their identities. Um, what were, I, I'll read the book to find out, but in a, a few moments, what were some of their everyday habits that they practiced um, or a couple examples of some everyday habits that you thought are 
um, very good to emulate just going about your day as a leader in a everyday organization that keeps pushing against the contempt and the oppression that they, that they're experiencing just by living. Yeah. Thank you for that. The first thing that comes to mind um, is Bishop Tanya Rawls was the, one of the first, she was the first um, ordained female bishop in the Unity Fellowship, uh, which is a Black denomination of affirming, um, LGBTQ affirming Christians. And she talks about in her interview with me, um, really thinking that, you know, they were hitting all the marks. And Bishop, she runs a human rights, just social justice organization um, that she's executive director, or well, was recently, she just retired, um, was at the time when I interviewed her, was running this social justice group. And so the church was, you know, embedded in the social justice, like practices and equality. Uh, and she thought they were doing well um, on all boards and they did an internal survey um, and she told me about the trans members bringing to them something as simple as bathroom, the, the equity of the bathrooms, that the bathrooms were themselves inequitable in square footage and utility in proximity to like the common space. Um, and it wasn't like the, oh, do we have gender neutral bathrooms? It wasn't that type of question. It was like functional things like, this bathroom doesn't have trash, you know, trash receptacles because I'm still menstruating, even though I'm a trans man and things that they thought they had been thoughtful about. They, in their cisgender leadership models were a, kind of oblivious to some of the day-to-day, -day, just everyday indignities of experience in a community that again, set itself out to be equal and equitable um, for all of its members. Um, she also brought up uh, as a learning curve in that community, um, the trans members really responded back like, you know, uh, you, you wanna say, you know, hey girl, you're looking fierce in this outfit and, and you know, you're complimentary. Um, and yet all that does is reinforce clocking. So when I don't hear it, that meant that day I did not perform my gender in such a way that was acceptable to you. And so, and actually what you think is an affirmation when it's not constant or when it's only on the days when I have on all my makeup or my earrings or this or that, this is actually um, an insult. And so making the community just aware of, again, these invisible indignities uh, that is an example. Um, another example that I think really was just an everyday practice that I hadn't thought about um, until the community sort of spoke to me about it. Um, Rabbi Lawson, when I interviewed her, was um, the chaplain at Elon College. And she had set up her community um, and she herself, like she plays the guitar and she's sort of the singing rabbi and, um, and, and she had this informal like community practice of like meeting students outside of Hillel because she felt that many students did not feel welcome in Hillel uh, that were LGBTQ. And so um, her choosing a coffee shop was her everyday practice of being Hillel everywhere and really actualizing that for students, helping them see that one, Jews are all in our community and they're everywhere and um, there's not one place for them to be and that's the acceptable place. And two, uh, she was a bodybuilder and, and, and she was open about that in the gym. Uh, she was a trainer and, and she, like I said, she played guitar. So she had all these different spaces where she was her full authentic self. And that everyday practice of wearing her wedding brand, saying my wife made me this smoothie this morning, like having these like everyday occurrences for her was resistive practice for students for whom for the first time they were away from their parents um, and were trying to make sense of their sexual and religious selves and find a balance. 
And the ease, she said, it looked like she had ease but they didn't know the, you know, the trauma, the stories, the struggle to get to just being able to say that. But the fact that she could was a resistive practice. Thanks so much, Jessica. And thanks to Dr. Melchie for your response. Mary, we'll go to you. Please unmute. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanna first thank you for the opportunity to listen to this presentation. It was excellent. Um, and I, I haven't been on here before, but I've been watching to be on. So this is really good. Um, I am the, I am on the national board for Dignity USA and, uh, we do all our zoom meetings, uh, every month. But one of the things that we've been doing lately is talking a lot about other materials. So I'm definitely going to share your book, Monique, with, Thank with you. our board. Um, I also wanted to share that I was a member of the sisters of Notre Dame out of Cincinnati. And um, our community had uh, has a, a black. I don't. I don't. I don't think she's a lesbian, but a black uh, sister who was the head of the whole community for some time. She was in the general aid in world. Uh, and I know she's got. I think she's done some writing. Her name's Sister Tara Cedar Wind. Uh, she's from Chicago. She's fabulous, but she lives in Cincinnati now. Um, and one of the things that's happened there is I, because of my connection with Dignity, I reached out to the new provincial, who I know very well, and asked if the sisters would consider signing on to the, the trans support bill that we, or trans support program that Dignity has. Very sadly, I had this conversation with her that said she really couldn't do that. She supported it fully, but the bishop controlled much of what they could get out and not get out. Mm -hmm. and it was very sad, you know, um, but I think it's something that we need to be aware of that, that a lot of the times in various churches, there's a hierarchy that still is preventing the best from happening. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to share that. And again, thank you. I'm going to share your book with the Dignity Board when I see them this month. <laughs> thank you so much. And if you would, if you would spell her name in the chat for me. Okay. Um, part of what Mary mentioned is the grant that I have funded, the Garden Initiative for Black Women's Religious Activism. We are seeking, um, and if you go to our site, gardenbwra.org, um, we are seeking to provide a digital archive of Black women religious leaders and activists. Um, and I'm doing my damnedest to make sure there's lots of queer representation, um, but the two of us that are working are Christian. And so we are Christian and Protestant. So the list of research subjects, the activists that we have, uh, we want it to be diverse, but it's not as diverse as it could be. So we keep asking for names and there's a way on our website that you can recommend names to us. But because you've given me her name, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add her to our research subject list. She is, she is absolutely fabulous. <laughs> so I, I just Thank typed you. it in there. Thank you, and we'll um, we're always happy to to make those connections for you too, Monique. Um, Teresita Wind is certainly a highly regarded uh, leader in Catholic circles. Let me continue the conversation. You make the case in your book that many of these black women went to white denominations because it was easier for them to get jobs in white churches than in black churches. In my racist ignorance and naivete, I hadn't quite put that together, but that's absolutely right. That. But what happens now when both black and white Christian churches seem to be on the wane? What's next? Where, where do you see all this going? How do young queer people, and I say queer people intense, uh, with intention, how do they prepare for different outcomes? Or will the scarcity model dominate it again and will we all lose as these churches shrink? I see the United Methodists, for example, um, having some, some real issues and among other churches, but certainly Roman Catholicism has dropped its numbers like a stone. Um, I'm not particularly sorry about that, but I'm. But but it, the question remains, how do people with a vocation for ministry and a willingness to serve, and more importantly, how do the needs of the world get met? How do the needs of the world get met when these things are happening? So what, what, do you, what, do we, what can we learn from your work? What, what have they shown us, these, these people who are, as you call them, incubators for social justice, whose spirituality animates social activism and who function as models of ethical leadership. Those are your three categories. They're absolutely spot on. 
But can you look into your crystal ball or does some other research help us to see what's next? Yeah, I'm making the claim that if we don't let them lead, there will be nothing left. I, I think really holding on to this vestige of patriarchy and the, the, the way church has been done, people aren't buying it. And especially in the Black community, which still remains the most religiously oriented community, being religiously oriented doesn't mean attendance. When you look at these Pew studies and they're marking like, do you believe in God versus do you attend a, a church? Do you attend a synagogue? Mm -hmm. They believe, but they won't attend. And you're not gonna keep your lights on if people aren't attending. Um, and so where are they going elsewhere? And um, that's what I'm finding with the, the para-institutional part of the book. It really talks about uh, these leaders are leading outside of their religious spaces. They are, you know, whether it's creating a social justice organization or it's going um, to the coffee shop and playing their guitars or, you know, doing something in the gym, that they are activating the principles of their faith outside of the spaces of their faith. And that's great. It serves the needs. It still pushes people towards freedom and liberation and getting, you know, ways of making meaning. But what does, where does that leave those who still believe in institutional religion? I, I, the future is, is grim. Just last week, two weeks ago, the black Baptist denomination, all black Baptist denominations met in Memphis. Um, and currently the president of Lot Carey Mission is a black woman which is the largest black missionary organization in the world. And she is a woman who pastors a church in Memphis. So all the black Baptists, all the different versions of Baptistdom got together. They had a, a annual meeting, a joint meeting. And because it was in her city, protocol said you, you asked somebody local to preach one of the events and it became a shit show. People got up and left, they recorded the, preaching and then they took the video down of her preaching ridiculousness in you know the year of our lord 2024 that we're still debating a woman who's been pastoring her church 25 plus years whether she has the audacity the right to preach to you know three four thousand black people in a convention hall ridiculous and what i'm seeing from those in social media are like why would i want to come and do that like this is your witness? No, I would not join up for that. I would not be interested in that. And so I think if you're going to hold on to what you want to hold on to, then that thing will have to die. Mm -hmm. And something new is what's going to be next. Something new that won't look like this institutional version of, of religion we're currently trying to save. Yeah, what, what I, I appreciate that so much. And one of the things that we haven't gotten to in this conversation, but is really central to the book, is this question of leadership. And I appreciated very much you're lifting up this new model, sort of steering away from charismatic leadership and emphasizing networking, community building styles. And I think you made that clear. Um, and I, But my worry is this, if men continue to lead and women build community, Will all the jobs and the positions that are left in these institutions go to men? And what do women who do who really want to change structures as well as, uh, as it were, the anatomy of religious institutions? Well, how, how can women do this? And how can women, I, I still don't know how these women that you interviewed made a living. How did they, how did they support themselves and their families? Um, I, I just, I can't, you know, it's, it's so hard. Because the institutions have not, and you just gave a brilliant example of the bishop, uh, you know, who couldn't preach in her own in her own territory. My glory! But how? So do you see what I'm talking about? These yeah. these figures coming together. You know, the shrinking of the churches, um, more leadership model of institution is male, uh, feminist womanist model is much more community building and networking. I mean, I hope you're right that that the move is toward that direction but how to make it sustainable. Yeah, and I worry about that. As I've, I've yeah. watched in the last four or five years, many of the people that I interviewed retire 
I worry about that because they were so bivocational. And I was never clear that they were bivocational because the church wouldn't let them be great. They, they couldn't do all the things they wanted to do in the church. They needed to eat. And they did this thing and then they got silenced and all their preaching opportunities fell away. So they had to, you know, pick up another gig, gig work here, gig work there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was all social justice oriented. It was, but it's grant based. You know, many of them are running organizations that run off of soft money. And I worry about what that means for ret people's retirement and ability to sustain themselves. And even as I watch younger leaders kind of replicate this model of working in and outside of religious spaces, as a person who, you know, is having deep conversations with my retirement director, like, uh, what does that mean if you don't want to work until you're 75? What does that mean um, if you want to buy a house in an ever-increasing housing market? And I agree with you, um, your point of if we share, there is enough. And I think that is what sustains many of them is that they share. They share opportunity, they share resources, they share grants. Uh, and that's that's how they keep keep on keeping on. But it doesn't trickle from the top. Like we still have the fat cat that's gotten to be the, the male leader that gets to stay the male leader that hoards all the, the nuts and all the other squirrels are foraging in, around the forest for everything that remains. Um, and, and that structure remains the same. And so it's gonna perpetuate that problem. Mm -hmm. Floor is open, friends. Um, comments, uh, questions you might have. You won't sleep tonight if you don't ask. And just the opportunity to, to be with uh, Monique Moultrie on this. Renata Rose, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Be sure to unmute. I wanted to ask if you interviewed anybody, uh, any woman, lesbian woman in the military, because for me, the injustice <laughs> comes to militarismus. And I wondered if anybody even would want to go into the military. I always hope no woman <laughs> would want to serve in the military, but uh, of course that's also unrealistic. Yes. Thank you for that question. Uh, that's the first time I've been asked about that. The I had two interviewees that um, were veterans. One, uh, Pamela Lightsey, um, had gone into theological education after her military work, and she felt a call to ministry while in the military. And um, she, she jokingly says she's United Methodist. And so while she was in the military, she felt a call, and the chaplain uh, that she was serving sort of alongside, told her, you know, you should be Methodist. And he was Methodist. He told her to be Methodist. He meant African Methodist Episcopal, AME. But, you know, he said, she said Methodist. So she is now an open lesbian in the United Methodist Church where she is causing all kinds of problems um, for them because she's ordained and she has all full rights and she's pastoring and she is very, very out. Um, in in their face out, uh, but kind of she was who she was when they took her. Uh, and so um, she credits the military for actually giving her the courage to do that. Uh, but her own work um, is on um, just war theory and, and her trying to reconcile the growth she felt she got in the military with what happened when her son was sent to Afghanistan. So she leaves the military during the Iraqi war, and then her son enters the military during our long season of um, post Saddam Hussein. Uh, and her baby being in harm's way, like changes her view of the military. Uh, and, and that she talks about in her scholarship, but also uh, as, as a pastor. So she's been very, very vocal right now with Palestine and and the Israel war um, and, and having conversations publicly about this. The other participant is the Jewish rabbi that I mentioned um, who was in the military because she left college and uh, she was, 
kind of the military cop. I can't remember now what the term for that is, but the MPs that are in charge of like handling base discipline. Um, and that was what she was in charge of. And um, she too found it formative, but also a deeper closet. She didn't have a religious, like she didn't grow up in any religious tradition. And she actually credits becoming a rabbi to being a personal trainer. So she gets put out of the military because she is queer. She comes back to Atlanta. She joins a gym. Um, she's working as a trainer. The guy she's training is a Jewish rabbi and she just vibes with the guy. He invites her to temple. She goes, she likes the people. Before she knows it, she's on the, the board. She's got keys to the building and um, thinks about herself as a Jewish leader suddenly. Um, but for her, getting kicked out of the military is what led her to becoming a religious leader, kind of ironically. So the question of nonviolence as a mission uh, was not asked. The, no, no. That definitely came up with Pamela um, because that's the basis of her scholarly work and her personal like ethos. Um, with Sandra, she's a Reconstructionist Jew, and it's certainly a part of you know the tikkun olam, the the concept of of doing no harm. Um, but she's not at she's not hiding the fact she was in the military, nor is she shameful of her participation in the military in some of the ways that I think Pamela now is. Monique, any closing comments you'd like to make? Anything we haven't touched on that you would like people to be thinking about? Thank you so much. And um, go hear their stories. On the LGBTQ RAN website, um, there are bio sketches. Uh, so even if you don't buy the book, I want you to know these women's stories. So there are bio sketches for each of the women, freely accessible there. It's LGBTQ RAN. Um, if you Google that, the website is now long. But if you Google that um, and go to oral histories, you can see a bio sketch. The bio sketches all have pictures of them uh, that were given to me by the women of various stages of their lives and things they were proud of. Um, and the audio is there if you want to actually listen to the women um, talk, but certainly the transcript is there. And I just want, I want to keep their stories alive. So yeah, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much and a good day to everyone. And um, Monique, we look forward to your next project. I hope the garden uh, has some success in fundraising. I know it's a very important project Thank and uh, we'll certainly uh, support that however we can as well. So uh, keep in touch. I and will. to all of you, um, have a great day and thanks for being part of this, I think, very important discussion on hidden histories faith and black lesbian uh, leadership. And I think this is a, a, a book you want to have in your library. Mary, I'm so delighted you're going to socialize it. I know we have already put it into our um, resources as well. So uh, thanks all and have a great rest of your day.